spring of 2021, I heard about the opportunity with Sunrise Publishing, which for those of you who aren't familiar with Sunrise, their publishing model is they have a mentor author and they have auditions for you to write under that mentor author in that mentor author's world. Finally, it was the day of the deadline. And I want to say like the deadline was at noon. It was probably midnight, but I just remember like, okay, fine. I'm just going to try and just see what happens. Welcome back to the podcast. Today I have with me Kristen Crum. She is an author of a YA novel and has an upcoming contemporary romance novel coming out that is about the Amish. So those of you who like Amish fiction, she's your girl. You want to go check out her new book. I'm so excited to have Kristen on today. She not only is she um, an author herself, she actually helps authors in that like virtual assistant capacity with her company that she runs. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in detail, but I just love that because I was actually just on an interview with somebody else and she was talking about just feeling overwhelmed with all the things she, you have to do as an author. And I was like, it's time for you to get a virtual assistant. And she's like, where do I find one of those? So for those authors who are listening today that just feel overwhelmed, you are somebody they can go to and get help from. So I am excited to talk about that. I'm excited to talk about your upcoming book. And I'm excited to talk about the publishing company that you are releasing that book through because they kind of employ a different model of publishing than I've ever seen. So I'm very excited to get into that with you today. So welcome, welcome, welcome. So glad to have you here. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. So before we get into all my questions for you. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself, anything that you think we should know, where you live, what do you, you know, do you have family, all those little things. So I'm Kristen and I live in a small town in Oklahoma. Actually, my husband and I just finished remodeling the house that he grew up in Ooh. and we have three kids. Yeah, we have three kids that are actually going to the same school that he did. He graduated from and my mother-in-law graduated from. So it's really, really it's really fun. That is fun. Um, yeah, I during the day I run a, a VA business and I write in the early morning and the margins of life and at night. I love the bookshelves behind you, by the way. Is that part of the remodel? Did you like specify it needed to have bookshelves in there? <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, my brother-in-law actually made that. <laughs> That's gorgeous. It's absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> I love it. It is. He did a great job. So, well, that, that's really a unique situation that you're like in the house he grew up in, that your kids are going, that's so cool. Like, I don't think we appreciate that legacy aspect of life that, you know, like we kind of are at this fast pace and sometimes we're a little bit of an island as families these days. And so that's just really neat that your, your family's experiencing that. So Kristen, yeah. you run this business for... Um, to assist authors, but you yourself are an author and they both, both of those things kind of have an entrepreneurial hat. And I want to start with how do, how do you navigate both of those first of all? And then how are they similar and how are they different from that? Like business perspective, that entrepreneurial hat, how do they, how are they similar? How do they differ? Oh, that is a great question. Me personally, it is always easier for me to do something for somebody else than it is for myself. <laughs> mm. And <laughs> a lot of a lot of what I do would be something that I could also incorporate into my writing life as well. At least when it comes to marketing and selling the books, all that fun stuff that we're just like, what? Mm. Um, but we also have to remember that like something that I might do for one of my clients might not translate and work well for me or work for another client or another author. So it's kind of learning all that I can and figuring out what works best for the particular client I'm working for, or even for myself. Mm. Do you find it's easy to like navigate, like when you have a company where you have a client and you're serving that client, is that easier for you to make like business decisions than it is for yourself with this like novel? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> How so? Like what, what, what 
trips you up when it comes to the novel? Because I'm guessing it's what a lot of us get tripped up by. Yes. So my my problem is mostly just with like time. I would rather devote my time helping somebody else than I would rather doing it for myself. So mm. that's kind of what trips me up as far as like when it comes down to it, if client A needs help or if I need to do it for myself, I'm going to do it for client A all day long. Mm. And then for me, I can't, it's, and it, it's honestly been that way in whatever aspects I'm doing, whether that is I'm selling something, you, you know, they have all of these different businesses that, that mm-hmm. people could do out of their homes. Right. Right. And I can try to do that. And I could help somebody else with their business so much better than I could do mine. Mm-hmm. Because sometimes so. it's hard for us to see, there's a phrase out there, like it's, it's hard to see our own label. Like it's hard to like mm-hmm. look at ourselves and see what it is we can offer the world and, and we can contribute. And so sometimes we kind of devalue the work that we do ourselves, unless it is for somebody exactly. else. It feels hard to put a, like hard to value that thing outside of ourselves, you know? And so mm-hmm. I think a lot of people struggle with that tension of, well, this person's asking this of me or this person, you know, my kids need me to do this thing. Their school needs me to do that. My husband needs me to help him with this. And it's so easy for us to just kind of put our own stuff that we have plans for. It's kind of easy to put those to the side and say, oh, I can wait. Because I think, I know for myself, I struggle with it feeling selfish because it's something I really, really enjoy doing. Do you struggle with that too? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So do you have any words of advice for the writer struggling with that? Like, is there something, some words of wisdom you have for us to help us get over that and, and to make our work a priority and treat it like the business that it is? Well, something that helps in my own, in my own life, which it kind of translates because, you know, I'm doing it for clients and then, you know, I'm trying to do it for myself as well when I step back and I treat myself as a client instead of Mm. just like, Oh, I'm doing this for me. It's not, I'm doing it for me anymore. I'm like doing it for me, the client. If that makes sense. Yeah. I think that's really a really smart, like distinction that we can give ourselves is to treat us like ourselves, like the client. Like I am the publisher or the business owner with my book and I have to figure out what the best route or way of getting this into the hands of the readers are the best way to market it, all those things. But it's not about me. It's about this this person who created this thing, right? I need to serve them with this marketing business hat. So I think that's really smart. So why don't we go a little bit into your writing journey? Like, how did you get to where you're about to release your second book? How did you get to where you released your first one? And you released that, you indie published that, right? You released it self-publishing. So tell us a little bit about that. How did you get to where you're at right now? Because you're not self-publishing the second one. Mm-mm. So I started way back when. It was years ago. And wrote a YA dystopian type novel. Ooh. I was getting it out to all the agents and trying to get an agent. And I was getting a lot of fights, but then I wasn't getting a lot of feedback. And it was in that point that I realized that I had gotten really comfortable in being rejected and I Mm. was like sending it out but I really wasn't expecting like to get anything didn't really think that that was a great place for an author to be and Mm. so I tried to write the next book but I couldn't get like I couldn't get the the dystopian story out of my head like the the characters and the flow and so my critique partner was like why don't you try writing like contemporary romance and I'm like, mm. that's not going to work. I like <laughs> killing my characters. And you don't do that in contemporary right. romance. I can't do that. And so I was like, okay, so I need to work on something else. Mm-hmm. I need to like build up my, I need to build up my writing. And so I was like, I will write like flash fiction and, mm. you know, have fun with that for a while. Right. So I got this idea for flash fiction and it just, kind of kept growing so I came up with the idea for the flash fiction which turned into it happened at Christmas 
<laughs> so I started writing it and I was like, wait, no, no, I really like these characters. You know, we need to keep going. And it ended up being, I was like, I'll just do like a short story. And then it kept growing. I was like, I'll do a novella. And by the time that I finished, it was like a full novel. So mm. I it's had, funny how that happens, I, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. So I I had talked with my local indie bookstore and we signed up, we scheduled a a book signing. And so then I like had this hardcore deadline that I had to work up to and I had because I couldn't show up to a book signing without a book. So true. <laughs> I self-published that first one and then that was at the end of 2019. And then 2020 happened and that's kind of it just everything changed. Mm. Kids came home from school. Within a six month period, my husband and I decided that we were going to move. So we were living in Arkansas. We were going to move to Oklahoma where he was from. We sold our house. He retired from law enforcement. We bought an RV and we lived in an RV. So we went from a house to an RV, we changed states. Our kids went from public school to being homeschooled and I was still working for all of my clients. So I was still writing. It was just kind of not as quickly as I wanted to. Mm. And then at the beginning, spring of 2021, I heard about the opportunity with Sunrise Publishing, which for those of you who aren't familiar with Sunrise, their publishing model is they have a mentor author and they have auditions for you to write under that mentor author in that mentor author's world. So Trisha Goyer is my mentor author. She also happens to be a dear friend and one of my clients. And she had been telling me for weeks, you need to try out. It's not it's a blind audition too. So she wouldn't have known that it was you, know, you. had I, yeah, thought it was me. She kept telling me, you need to audition. And I'm like, I don't write Amish fiction. I can't write Amish <laughs> fiction. I wrote Maya. And so she kept telling me, kept telling me, kept telling me. Well, finally, it was the day of the deadline. And I want to say, like, the deadline was at noon. It was probably midnight. But I just remember, like, okay, fine. I'm just going to try and just mm -hmm. see what happens. Like, I'm just going to submit and see what happens. And so right. I did. And a week later, I got a call that, well, it wasn't a week later. It was a month later. Three months, I can't remember. I, I know that it was quick. Yeah. If it was, even if it was a month, that's a lot quicker. Yeah. I know somebody who yeah. just recently had an agent ask her to resubmit something to him, said, I am thinking about pitching it to these places. She submitted it to him and it's already been four weeks and she still hasn't heard yeah. anything back. And yeah. so it's, I mean, they're just, they've got a lot to work through. So it's nothing, it's not a criticism on the agent. It's mm -hmm. just that to get an answer in a month is like amazing. That's so yeah. cool. Yeah. That is what I really, really liked about Sunrise is that like you submit and then you don't have to wait forever yeah. to find out, are you moving to the next step? So I heard it was whatever the time frame, the quick time frame, um, mm -hmm. I heard that I had moved on to the next, the next round and I had to submit a, like a scene from the book that I had pitched, what ultimately turned into the golden class. And then I think it was, I want to say it was another week, but it was probably another month. <laughs> I'm probably rushing them. <laughs> but it, again, it was real quick. <laughs> real quick. Yeah. Yeah. So they, yeah. they yeah. accepted you. So now you have been mm -hmm. working with her. She, mm -hmm. she wrote the first book in the series, right? Is that how mm -hmm. it happens? So she writes the first book, you write the second one. And she, on the cover, I notice it says like, she presents you. Like she's, she's saying like, yeah. Yeah. I kind of get my stamp of approval, yeah. which is a really cool, it's yeah. like taking collaborative to the next level. It really is. Oh yeah. Oh Yeah. Yeah. And one another thing that Sunrise does that isn't isn't like no other publisher I've heard does this is they will take their authors and with the mentor author and they will have a week of brainstorming the mm. book. So you meet, you brainstorm. I met with Trisha Trisha Goyer, who is my mentor author, and then Susie May Warren, who's the publisher, and we just 
Oh, it was like heaven because we just talked. I can't. Yeah, I'm sure. Like, and- yeah, exactly. Like, what better thing to do than sit in a room yeah. with two other writers and talk about, yeah, story. Yeah. yeah, it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. After that, they gave me my deadline of, you know, here's when we need the first draft done. And then they work through you through each process. So they work through you with the line edits and the editorial letter. And it's, it's, it's really great. It's awesome. I love the whole process that I've been through with them. So can we go into a little bit of the specifics of that kind of book deal, essentially? Because it's, it's a book deal, right? Like you probably had to sign a contract with them mm-hmm. and everything. So how does that work for you as the author, as far as like, it's, is it just for this one specific book? Or do you have like future books in, as part of the plan? With this one, I actually signed a two book contract. Okay. So there's On the Golden Cliffs and then the next book will be releasing in 2024. And then I also signed another book, or another contract for another single book in the same series that will also release in 2024. So so my question to you about Sunrise and that kind of model of having the mentor, author, and and you do have to audition. So there's like an acquisitions process to it. Is it set up like a mm-hmm. traditional publisher where you receive royalties or is it more of a hybrid where you have to pay into it and you buy your author copies? Yeah, no, it is very much set up like a, a traditional publisher. So mm-hmm. you would get your royalties and your author copies. Yeah, So that's really fascinating. That's fascinating that, and it's really cool that they've done that. So there's no financial burden to the author to engage in this very cool model of publishing and kind of that mentorship aspect of it. Like, I don't think I've heard of another publisher doing that. And I just think that's really cool for somebody to take another writer under their wing and say, okay, let's do this together and collaborate. And you'll have kind of the brand recognition with my name can now be associated with yours. And that only helps you. So that's just a, that's a very cool collaborative offer that they're doing it really is and another thing too is that sunrise publishing is very much a family once you're in like you get added into a discord chat and i mean authors from season one and season what are we on season eight seven nine i don't even know what season we're but we're all together and we're all like chatting and if we're frustrated about something i mean we can we chat it out if we need prayer we can bring it to the discord chat and then you have all of your, your author family really mm. lifting you up in prayer. I mean, it's just, it's really awesome because it's not like, okay, I got this deal and I wrote this book and now what, you know, exactly. it's, you have all of these people coming around you. So it's awesome. It's amazing. And I think that's something that our listeners today, they really need to take into account when they're making a decision about where their book is going to land. If it is going to be with a traditional publisher, maybe a smaller, a smaller press, just be really aware of the type of support they're offering you, the type of communication they're giving you. Those are just really key things in the publishing process that can make or break this experience for you as an author. And so what it sounds like, Kristen, is that they're just really supportive and they're really communicative communicative and those just add to that experience of like excitement over your book I've heard too many stories of authors who are like so I sent off my book and then I didn't hear anything about it for like six to nine months and you're like oh that's so sad (laughs) because this is your the thing that you've been working on you're excited about this product and you want to share it with the world so at what point in the process did they let like give you permission to start sharing it with your with your followers and people that you wanted to let know that there's a book coming out? Yeah. So one of the things that Sunrise does, which I think is really, really cool, is I think it was back in December. It was me, Trisha, and then Ellie, who is the other author in our series. We got together to do a Facebook Live to kind of announce to the world that the series was coming out and to show our book covers and kind of start hyping up the excitement that Mm -hmm. was coming. The Big Sky series, Trisha has three books previous in the series and it's actually one of her best-selling series and she's been having people ask for years like we want more stories in this in this in this world and so we're excited to be able to give them more stories in this world yeah so that's cool that you guys kind of utilize each other's platforms is what it's happening Mm -hmm. and announcing across that I think that's when did you say that you you got into the deal with them 
Was it last year or the year um, before? Like so how I, long has the process been for you? 2021 is when I signed the contract and then 2022, like, okay. So yeah. And then at the beginning of 2022, I turned in my first draft. And I want to, I want to point so, this out. I think yeah. this is an important distinction because they did not expect you to bring a manuscript. They expected no. you to bring the ability to tell a story. And that's a huge yeah. difference. Like the, no other traditional publisher treats you that way. It's at least if there is one, I have not heard of them in the fiction world. They want you to have your manuscript completed first. If you are a, I mean, I know you've already published one before, but for mm -hmm. the most part, like it, unless you've been published with them or somebody else that they recognize, they're not going to take you without having your manuscript done. And I think that's just such a disservice to fiction writers. I mean, the nonfiction world manages to pull it off just fine. <laughs> like, I think yeah. the fiction world can too. And you're proof of it. Like sign the book, have a goal, work towards it, develop the thing mm -hmm. within the bigger context of like what we're marketing, what we're doing, what the goal is, is. And I think that just makes a much more successful novel. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Yes, I would. Did you, did you ever consider going any other route or were you like, Trisha's like, no, you need to audition. And you're like, okay, fine. I have always wanted to be a hybrid author. So I've always wanted to be traditional and, and self-published right now in my life. Like this, this model is working really well for me, mm -hmm. but I mean, I have so many stories and I love story. I love telling stories. So I'm up for whatever. <laughs> And I, I think that's an important thing to note too. It's like, you got to go with what works best for you in the season of life you're in. And I think that you're doing just that. So that's awesome. Okay. I want to pivot a little bit because I know part okay. of your business is helping with podcasting. And I think you have a podcast, right? And yes. 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 Exploring so, the link page. Yes. And I am curious your thoughts on writers, specifically fiction writers, utilizing podcasts to help grow their platform. Do you have any thoughts on that? I think it's really beneficial to help grow your platform because if you think about it, everybody is always on the go all the time. And I mean, even we have this big boom with audiobooks, right? Mm -hmm. Because everybody, they don't have time to sit down and read a blog post or scroll through social media so or you know, read a book. So it's an audio book or podcasting. And I think that you can, it can be a higher reach because tapping into that podcast is podcast platform as well. And so, and you're bringing in new readers that you might not be able to touch otherwise. So I think, well, I think it's, it's kind of new, especially mm -hmm. for fiction authors, but I think, I mean, I think it would, I think it's like going to be a new thing really. So here's the question, because every time I tell an author this, they're like, but what do I talk about? Like, what do I do <laughs> as a fiction writer? Because I'm not a nonfiction. I'm not teaching them how to do something. What do I talk about? Do you have any suggestions? Like if they wanted to start a podcast? Yeah. Like what would they do it um, on as a fiction writer? That's what they're always, that's obvious. That is like, honestly, the number one um objection that I get is I don't want to do a podcast because yeah. I don't know what it would be about oh goodness you could do you could do a podcast on I mean you could write you could write short stories and have the short and like read the short stories and have other authors write kind of like a modern love podcast mm. where people are writing love stories and then they're having people read them um you could talk about craft you could talk about craft books you could kind of do like a whole, this is how Stephen King says to write. And I tried it for a week and this is what happened. Mm -hmm. um, and just kind of talk through that. I've heard of fiction authors kind of just jumping on and talking about here's what they're working on and here's what they're getting tripped up over and here's what they're enjoying this week. And it doesn't really sound like, oh, that would be a great podcast, but we're in it. We're in the thick of it every single day. And we have to remember that our readers, we're kind of like peeling back the curtain, right? We're kind of mm -hmm. like showing them what it's like to write the book, even though we're like, I don't, there's, there's nothing interesting about it, but somebody who doesn't do it every single day, right. it's very interesting. 
I mean, I do it every day and I still like to hear about other people's processes right. and what they're going through. So, yeah. And I think, I think sometimes we're like, well, it would be so much easier if we like painted or we, you know, <laughs> did music or something. And it can be this like, very, like you make this thing and it, you can show it off. But I think there's something to be said about showing off the creative process as well, not yeah. just the end product. Yeah, definitely. Well, I liked what you said there about, you know, like just, of just sharing the behind the scenes, just peeling back the curtain for your reader and not devaluing that. I think that's important. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's good advice. And so if they want to get started podcasting, do you have any resources that you would point them to? Very inexpensively, they could totally get started podcasting using Anchor FM for a host, which is completely free and it's put out by Spotify. Honestly, I haven't really tapped into all that you can do in Anchor, but I know that they have music that you could use for your intro and your outro. They have transition sounds. I think they even have like ad slots that you can add in. And so you can modernize your podcast like right out of the gate, or you might have to have so many downloads first or something, but yeah, they make it really simple. It's really, really easy. And it's not is as that hard what, as. Is that what you use for your podcast? Yes, it's what I use for my podcast, and I have a couple other clients that use it as well. Um, other podcast posts that I like are like Libsyn. I think that one is paid, but it's really easy to use. And then like for audio editing, if you have Mac, you can use GarageBand. That's what I used for a long time. I use Adobe Audition now, and that comes in an Adobe creative Adobe package that right. we get monthly. So yeah, I personally use podcast six. It's a, a paid program to host too, but it's mm -hmm. fairly inexpensive. It's very simplistic to use. And then for my editing, I use Descript. Descript. <laughs> and, and I personally like that because as a writer, I tend to like, it is easier for me to edit off of a script than it is for me to listen nice. for the different nuances. And so, but that's just because yeah. I'm a visual learner. Mm -hmm. So for those who are listening that I was very intimidated by podcasting before because I have a hard time with audio. And so just know that there's tools out there that are there for you. And it just might take a little bit of digging, but there's, there's a lot of good resources out there once you do. So, so we've talked a little bit about your, your process of getting to where you're about to release your novel. We have talked about the very unique publishing model with Sunrise, which is very cool and exciting. I just think, I think the publishing industry needs to be shook up a little bit. And I think things like what they're doing at Sunrise is going to do that. And I think that's exciting. And then we talked a little bit about like podcasting, Christian fiction writers, maybe, maybe consider utilizing it. It's a good thing. Yeah. Now I want to get into marketing. Just, I want to yeah. kind of go there a little bit. What mark, cause I have seen your Instagram. It's pretty rad. And I like, I love your reels, Thanks. but I just am wondering, you know, like social media, it seems like you're using Instagram. Are there, are you anywhere else? And is that your primary marketing tool or have you done other things in addition to that? I would say right now, Instagram probably is my primary marketing tool. I'm also on TikTok very badly. I'm not very good at the whole TikTok thing. Same, honestly. same, same, <laughs> same. I'm on there, but I'm not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know people keep talking about like going viral and, and I'm like, yeah, I don't know how. I've also been working on building my mailing list, my newsletter list, which I think is very powerful too, because you always hear the horror stories about what happens if Instagram goes down and then you lose all your followers. And right. When you, when you build that list, it's, and two, when you build your list, those are your people, right? Mm -hmm. You might not, you might not reach all of your thousand followers that you have on Instagram, but you will reach all your thousand followers on your mail list pending you don't end up in their spam. Right. So those are like your people. And so I feel like it's very, very important. Yes, to build, to market towards building your, your Instagram platform, but don't, don't forget about your newsletter list because that's so, important. So do you, what do you offer for lead magnets? Because that's another thing I always hear is like, I don't know what to put on lead. I don't have a lead magnet. <laughs> okay. So how are you building your, how are you building your list then? So right now my list building has been from 
giveaways on Instagram. Like I do collaborative okay. giveaways. I do, I do have a lead magnet during, I did have one during November for NaNoWriMo. I do, I do very badly because I'm not a very good NaNoWriMoer, but I do what's called backwards NaNo. So you start the month with this outrageous, outrageous word count goal. And by the day, the, by the time that you hit November 30th, the last day, you're down to, you'd have to write one word for the day. So it, it kind of helps because when you, when you start at the beginning of the month, you're super excited and you can write and you can write and you can write. And by the time it gets to the middle of the month, you're like, what are words? I don't know. So <laughs> I do offer, I do offer that as a principal in November for a lead magnet. And then what else have I done in the past? I've done a, I've done a like top YA rom-com Christmas book. Mm. That one was, that one was super fun. But right now I don't have a lead magnet. So that's kind of, yeah, <laughs> I need <laughs> one. I know I need one. <laughs> I know it's like, do what they say, not as I do. Right. <laughs> yes. Yes. Very much so. But I will say this, I will say that when you get a lead magnet, make sure you keep it fresh. So, mm. I mean, if your lead magnet has been on there for two years, probably time for an update yeah yeah maybe switch some things up and then you can constantly be building that list because you're constantly giving something Mm -hmm. free away so true true so with your first book did you try did you have a book launch and did you do any kind of book marketing that was really useful for getting sales that you can share with us I launched my first book very, very badly because at the same time, two of my clients were also launching books and it goes back to, Uh, yep, (laughs) it goes back to clients' books or my book, you know, which Mm -hmm. one, which one wins. I did, I was able to schedule book signings, which I think were helpful. I did a few can't even remember how many I did but there was a couple of any bookstores in the small town that I was in that I booked at and then my library what else did I do I feel like I'm doing book launch a little bit better this time okay so what are you doing different and better so what's the difference (laughs) (laughs) well I think the difference is is that I don't really feel like oh well it's just my book it's not Mm. my book so you know Mm -hmm. it, it kind of at least that's what I'm telling myself so that I don't feel bad that I'm like promoting myself because you know so there is a there is a term for what you're describing I don't remember the actual term of it but Mm -hmm. what it comes down to is like there's two ways people are motivated it's either internally motivated or externally motivated and you seem to be a person who's more externally and I am too it takes like everything in me to be more like I will put my stuff aside if something else is motivating me to respond so it's yeah. I I want I want you and anybody else hearing it, like that's that's actually I think probably a common thing for writers and it's nothing to be ashamed of. But what you can do is what Kristen has done, put herself in a situation that helps that and supports that and gives her kind of guardrails to protect her time and protect her writing. Well, and because you don't want to come across either as like, oh my gosh, all I'm doing is talking about me and my stuff. Because Think about it. Other authors that you see doing it, you don't think, oh my gosh, what are they doing? Why are they like pushing and talking nothing about their book? You don't say that. So, Mm -hmm. you know, stop telling yourself that. Yes. Yes. This time around, I've gotten really intentional about my social media, what I'm sharing, how I'm sharing. I have a pretty good, I think a pretty good pre-order incentive. I'm actually partnering with a local indie bookstore to make sure that any paperback pre-orders that go through the bookstore, they're all signed and personalized. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So super, super fun. What else are we doing? I'm actually getting on podcasts <laughs> to talk about the book, which scares me to no end, which I know it's funny because I'm a podcaster myself, but, but yeah, I'm actually like booking out podcasts, which I think like we talked about is a really good way to get the word out about your book because you know people will be listening and you'll reach a different audience or you could potentially reach a different audience than just like who you have on Instagram see what else I think I think that's probably it don't start talking about it too soon 
-hmm. that that would be a good tip because then you have I mean you'll people people will get tired about hearing about it and they will also it'll be so far out that they won't remember that they can pre-order it so make sure that you give yourself like Mm -hmm. a good time frame so what's a good time frame that you would suggest my sweet spot is like six weeks Mm -hmm. I know sometimes when you're working with like a bigger publisher they might have a different timeline and you you're not talking about you're not talking about like mentioning that you have a book coming out or talking Mm -hmm. about like oh here's the cover you're not talking about that you're talking about like hardcore selling right yes yes yeah yeah you don't want to hardcore sell like eight months out because then people are going to be like wait oh yeah I forgot totally about that book and you're not going to want to talk about it for eight months (laughs) no and I I had I had a business coach once who told me if you are not exhausted by the end of your launch period, you are not doing it right. And I was like, Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not I doing it I'm right. Been, <laughs> I think I've only been talking about it for two weeks and I'm like, okay, I got four more. I could do this. That's a good timeline. Six weeks out. That's good. That's a good word of advice there. Speaking of words of advice, do you have any other tips or thoughts you want to share with those listening about the publishing journey and writing and all the things? I heard this quote today and I really liked it. And it was actually talking about mountain climbers, but I think it can pertain to authors really, really well. And this comes from Alex Lowe. Don't know who he is, but he's who said this. And he said, the best climbers in the world is the one who is having the most fun. Mm. And I was like, that can so be related to the writing journey. Mm-hmm. The best writer in the world is the one who's having the most fun. So mm. that's good. That's, that's what it is. Have fun. I mean, it's, you're creating and you're bringing these stories to life and it should be fun. It shouldn't be a drudgery. It shouldn't be not enjoyable. Right. Because if so, why are you doing it? We're not in this to make money. <laughs> right. We, we want to make money. We're okay with making yeah, money, but yeah, it's yeah, hard yeah. to make money selling books. <laughs> yeah. And that's, so like, yeah. we have to come into it with realistic expectations, but exactly. we can, can, we can hit goals, you know, as well. We can yeah. have both things. Yeah. And I, I liked what you said about like, have fun with it and not just the creative writing side of it, like have fun with the marketing side of it too. Like people yeah. want to read your story, like, and they are not going to know about it unless you tell them. So have fun telling them because if you're excited and, and having fun, they're going to get excited and have fun, right? Exactly. And you've worked really hard. It's a hard thing to write a book. So be proud of that. And even more so, because like we hear this often in the nonfiction book coaching world. It's like, it's hard to write a book. Be proud of yourself. Like fiction writers, it's even harder to write a novel. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, it's hard to write a nonfiction book. Don't get me wrong. I've done it. It's, It's hard, but it is even harder to craft an entire new world with entire new people, with entire new experiences and like have to make that make sense and do it in a way that somebody else can experience it too. That's an amazing skill set. You should celebrate it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So as we are wrapping up, do you have any tools that you're like, make sure you get this tool? I really enjoy writing in Scribner. Okay. And yes. And honestly, I was super intimidated by it for a very long time. And I never, like, I would get in there and I was like, I don't know how to use this. I don't understand it. However, I finally, and the tutorials that they put out, I couldn't watch because I was like, I don't understand what you're saying at all. They're a little, they're a little, yeah. They're a little overwhelming. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I watched a tutorial by, Another YA author, Adrienne Young, she has a tutorial on her Instagram and she like just walks you step by step with how she sets up like her document. Okay. And after I watched that and after I set up my Scrivener like that, I was like, oh, okay. I get this now. I understand. So I, I like, I enjoy writing in Scrivener. I know it's kind of like a little controversial you know people like it some people don't I think it's pretty cool I just I'm like you I was like overwhelmed by it at times and so I just kind of haven't really utilized it to its full potential Mm -hmm. but that's a good point about like hey don't give up on a tool like go like not just google tutorials but google tutorials from Mm -hmm. other writers and see how they're utilizing it that's really smart there's another writer 
and I can't even think of her name, Abby Emmons. I think. Oh, yeah. I think she has a pretty good tutorial on YouTube as well. So, I mean, there are tutorials out there by other authors that make a lot more sense especially like especially fiction authors because i yes. think it's originally a screenplay yes writing i think so, you're right yeah yeah so that's what i would say <laughs> awesome okay well you know what? you have given us so much to think about i am so excited for people to listen to everything you had to share today i think it was fabulous and so insightful can you tell us where to find you where can we hang out with you on Insta- well instagram i know for sure but where at on the internet, can we find you? Mm-hmm. And remind us again when your novel is releasing. So Instagram is probably the biggest place that I hang out. I love Instagram. I love DMing with readers so and other writers. So, you know, drop me a DM. You can find me there at Kristen Crumb. And then my website is kristencrumb.com. I think I'm on Facebook as well. I'm not a big Facebook fan. But if you talk to me over there, I'll talk to you. So I do think that this episode will probably air after your book comes out. So after it's been released, where can they find it? They should be able to find it wherever they purchase books. Okay, perfect. So Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, wherever they, whatever floats their boat, they can find it there. Awesome. (laughs) Well, thank you so much, Kristen, for being on the podcast today. I really appreciate it. I appreciate all your, your wisdom, all the things you had to share with us. I'm looking forward to, to cheering you on as your book releases. And just thank you again for being willing to share with us. Thank you so much for having me. This has been a lot of fun. And thank you for listening to today's episode. Come back next week as we continue the conversation on the business of Christian fiction. Bye.